Uh, if this is your first time here or second time here, we've been in a series called Wonder, uh, and we've been, it's more of an apologetic series. So when we consider the truthfulness of Christianity, we want to know if we don't use the Bible, right? If we just kind of throw the Bible out, does God exist? Is there information and knowledge that we can have access to that would help us understand whether or not we can answer the question, does God exist? It's either yes or no. The first week we talked about, does truth exist? And we ended our sermon with a conclusion that, yes, truth exists. We were able to go through some just really just bad, false ideologies that are prevalent in our society. Like, for instance, if I were to say the truth claim, all truth is relative, right? Remember from Sermon 1, we would apply the claim to itself. Is that a relative truth? Because if it's true that all truth is relative, then all truth can't be relative. So it's self-defeating. Or say I say the statement, there is no such thing as truth. And we would respond with, is that true? So these were some self-contradictory statements. We came to the conclusion that yes, truth does exist. And so when we ask the question, does God exist? It's not relative. It's objective, the answer is. It's either yes or it's no. Last week, Matt was able to present to you a little bit of evidence, and there's a whole lot more, but a little bit of evidence for the existence of God. He presented to you what's called the cosmological argument. And it, and it summarized, basically, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the logical, unavoidable conclusion, the universe has a cause. And if the universe was time, space, and matter, that means whatever caused the universe to come into existence is timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and incredibly powerful to bring the universe into existence out of nothing. You can think about nothing like this. Nothing is what rocks dream about. It's nothing. It's not something. It's the absence of anything. It is nothing. Uh, and so that was one of the proof texts for the existence of God. And there are other arguments. For instance, the teleological argument, which argues from design the universe is finely tuned uh, for the existence of life on earth. But you can go research that yourself. Uh, Matt gave you a good book to read called On Guard. Today we're going to be talking about the moral argument. Is there such a thing as morality? Now, many of you, if not all of you, are aware of the horrendous tragedy, the moral atrocity, we would say, that took place in Annapolis just a few days ago where five people lost their lives and several others were injured and people were traumatized, their family members were lost. And so in talking about morality today, I thought that it would be appropriate that maybe we could just offer up some prayers for those uh, family members and those who did lose their lives um, together. So would you pray with me? Lord, we recognize you as the supreme good and the one who is ultimately just. And Father, we're not quite sure why you've allowed the kind of evil that takes place in this world to happen. But Lord, we do trust you and we know your heart and so we trust your hand. And Father, I pray for the victims who were murdered, Father, by not a crazy person, but an evil person. And Father, I pray that you would heal their families, that you would heal their children, that you would heal our county, our community, and that, Father, we as Severn Christian Church could be the beacons of light that you have called us to be, that we could bring not just rational answers to the equation, but uh, heartfelt answers, empathy, and truth. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die at the hands of evil men for our sakes. And Lord, we know that you're not some God that's sitting distant on a throne, completely unaware and tapped out to what goes on here. But Father, you experienced this pain. You suffered it yourself on the cross. And you know what we go through and what their families are going through. So Father, we pray for their comfort. We pray for their healing. And we pray for justice to be served. That it would be done in such a way that brings glory to you. Thank you for the men and women who rushed into harm's way to save lives and their response time. And Father, we pray that you would protect them and that you would give them your righteous judgment and your righteous sword to execute your justice here on earth. Father, we love you and we pray that your will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we talk about objective morality, here's the question. Did that man do something wrong? Did he do something wrong? Or did he do something that we just find is socially taboo? It just doesn't 
uh, fit our opinion and what we like about reality. And that's our, our truth. But for his truth, he really didn't do anything wrong. Can we say that what this man did was objectively wrong? Did he make a conscious decision to act upon his instinct of anger and hatred to take the lives of five innocent people? You see, as human beings with a conscience, we can look at the animal kingdom and we can see the way that they treat each other and we can say, well, animals are going to do what animals are going to do. That's the animal kingdom. They're not like us. When a person takes another person's life through murder and kills an innocent human being, we can look at that and we can say that is morally wrong. He did the wrong thing. That's what we call objective truth. We can look at these actions that people carry out with absolute moral repulsion. Why? Because deep inside of our hearts, we all know the difference between what is right and wrong, what is good and bad. And this is what we call objective moral values and duties. Let me ask you a question. If Adolf Hitler won the war and he said that the murder and the killing of all Jewish people is the right thing to do, and he brainwashed the entire world to believe that truth. Is that right? Is something right because the majority of people vote it to be right, or everyone in the world believes it's right? Or, even regardless of human opinion, something is objectively wrong, and something is objectively right, even if everyone's brainwashed to believe the opposite to be true. I'd like to define a few terms before we go any farther this morning. The first term that I'd like to define for you is what's called a moral value. This is something that is either good or bad. For instance, it's the worth of a person, right? This is what deals with a a worth, an idea of, of being a worthy person or a worthy action. When we talk about moral duties, we're talking about something that is right and wrong. It's an obligation to act in a certain way, whether that be right or wrong. And so this deals with something that we ought to do. So when I talk about moral values and duties this morning, these are the two terms that I'm going to be referring to. And the question that we're asking this morning is this, are there objective moral values and duties? A key phrase that I think would help bring a lot of clarity for all of us this morning is this, to say there are objective moral values and duties is to say that these moral values and duties are true, independent of human opinion. That's what we mean by objective. As I gave the illustration, even if Hitler brainwashed everyone to believe that killing Jews was the right thing to do, it would still be objectively wrong. Because there are certain things that are true and certain things that are false, certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong, regardless of human opinion. And so now that we've defined our terms, I do want to say a few things this morning about what I'm not saying to you. The first thing is this, is that we are not saying that people who don't believe in God are immoral people and can't be uh, moral, don't have the ability to have objective moral values and duties. That's not what we're saying this morning. What we are saying is that if God does not exist, there is no good ground to say that objective moral values and duties do exist. And that's what we're going to get into this morning. The next thing that we need to distinguish is this. Now, I know these are big words, and I'm not trying to sound like a super genius, because the reality is, is I'm not. (laughs) I'm really not that smart of a guy. But we need to distinguish between two types of terms here. The first one is what's called moral epistemology. Now, for those of you who have taken psychology classes or philosophy classes, when you use the word epistemology, this means this is the theory of how we come to know things, right? So when it comes to moral epistemology, we're dealing with how we come to know moral values and duties. What we are going to be discussing today is what's called moral ontology. It deals with the nature of being. Um, We could say it like this, the moral ontology is something that can be discovered. So we are not saying that how a person comes to know something determines whether or not it's objective or subjective. What we're saying is, regardless of how someone comes to know something, can it be true or false, objectively? I've got a few illustrations for you. Let's say you lived 2,000 years ago as an American Indian. Obviously, Their moral values and duties were much worse than ours, and we've progressed today, right? Or let's say you lived 200 years ago in the Wild West, right? 1700s, 1600s, 1800s, whatever. And let's say that that's the kind of morality that you had, but today your morality is better. 
is the progress of morality, right, the progression of morality, does that determine whether or not truth is subjective or objective? Well, absolutely not. Just because someone had a really bad morality 2,000 years ago doesn't mean that objective morality does not exist. Even if you do study civilizations and you do look into history, you will soon find that the morality really isn't that great of a difference. You might find some minor differences here and there, but it's really not that, that far widespread between. But what about this? Let's say, let's say this. Let's say our morality came through biological evolution. Let's just grant that to be true. Does that mean that morality is not objective just because biological evolution produced our inner morals? Well, absolutely not. Why? How we come to know something does not determine whether or not that thing is objectively true or objectively false. It's illogical to make that connection. Just because something has a genesis and we know what that genesis is does not determine its truthfulness. And so how an idea originates is irrelevant to whether or not it is true. We could get morality from our parents. We can learn morality from our societies. Let's just even grant that morality is this ingrained biology that we have. Does that make that morality true or false? Well, certainly not. Why? Because we're not talking about how we come to know things. Let me give you another example. Let's say I've told you that the New American Standard Bible, the NASB, you trust Rick, is the best English translation that you can get. And so here today, you say, you know what? I don't really want my digital Bible. I want to go out and I want to buy a hardback. And so you go to the store and you buy a hardback because Rick told you that the NASB is the best English translation that you have, that you can have. So you come back and you're all excited and you want to show me your new Bible. And I'm like, wow, that's really great. I'm glad you went out and bought a Bible. And, and you're, you're really pumped up about it. And so you come up to me and you say this. Oh, uh, well, look at the Bible that I have. Isn't this great? I followed, your, I followed your direction. I said, I was just kidding. I didn't really know whether or not the NASB was the best English translation that you could have. I just, I just suggested it. Just as kind of like a joke. Does that mean that the NASB is not the best English translation? Well, No. Just because I even held an idea in my mind that I didn't know whether or not it was true or false doesn't mean that that idea is true or false. And believe it or not, the NASB is actually the best translation that you can have. It's 95% word-for-word translation. They try not to add any thoughts or any extra ideas in it. And so it actually is the best translation that you could have. And so just because I had false information, it didn't make the idea false. Truth is still truth, even if it comes from an unreliable source. Think Another example would be, think about it like this, the truth of mathematics. Two plus two equals what? Equals four. Where did you learn that from? You learned it from your parents, your teachers. Now here's the thing, just because you learned it through that source does not determine whether or not 2 plus 2 equals 4 is actually true. Are you with me on that? So how we come to know something does not determine whether or not something is true. I could be somebody that's living on an island and I never heard about mathematics in my entire life. That doesn't mean 2 plus 2 equals 4 is not true. And so the key phrase would be simply this. You can't show a view false by how it originated. This is what's called the genetic fallacy. And this is really relevant when you're talking with people about whether or not morals do exist or don't exist. Because they'll say, well, no, our morals are just a byproduct of our evolution. And it's just for the benefit and the welfare of society. That's the only reason why you believe your objective morality. It's really, at the end of the day, subjective. And so you're able to show this difference between moral epistemology and moral ontology. But while we know an idea is not false because of how it originates, does that mean that morality is objective? Couldn't morality still be subjective? I mean, at the end of the day, don't you hear this every day? What's true for you is true for me, and what's true uh, for, for somebody else is what's true for them. All truth is relative. All truth is subjective. So let's answer that question. I was in a high school class, I took a high school psychology class, and the teacher decided to split us up into groups of five. And many of you maybe have experienced this or heard this before. And here was the challenge. Every member, right, five of you, are on a raft that can only hold four people. And the only way for everyone to survive is for one person to go, otherwise everyone will die. 
And so what you've got to decide to do as a group is how are, what decision are you going to make? Is someone going to die? Are you going to throw them off? Are you all just going to die together? And so they split you up into groups, and they want you to talk about whether or not um, you would do X, Y, or Z. And you could come up with whatever solution that you have. And so group A might say, well, the weakest link, right? Survival of the fittest. That's what we're here for, evolution. We'll just throw the weakest person off. And the second group would say, well, we know it's not really right to kill a person if they don't want to be killed. As weird as that sounds. So we're all just going to die together. And then say the third group says, well, the oldest, right, who's lived the longest, that's the person that's going to die. And so the teacher brings everybody back together, and they show everyone the different answers, and the teacher says, see, morality is relative. Everyone's got a different moral outcome. And the intention is to show that there is no such thing as objective morality. Now, how would you respond to that? If somebody gave you that example... Well, I think the first thing I would say is this. Obviously, there's a moral dilemma going on because everyone in the group knows what the right thing to do is. The question isn't what's right or wrong. The question is whether or not you're going to do the right or wrong thing. Everybody believes in the preservation of life. Life is precious. And so that's where, that's where the moral dilemma comes in from. And so the point to show that morality is subjective really actually shows and demonstrates the opposite truth, that you have this great moral dilemma going on because everyone really does know in their heart what the right thing to do is. The problem is, is that they also have a survival instinct. And so they're waging war. Do I survive or do I cling to life and hope that something works out? Well, here's the question. What do you call the thing that governs between those two instincts. What do you call the thing that governs the survival instinct and the uh, appreciation for humanity and the survival of your species instinct? Because you got two that are, that are going on. There's a war taking place. What is the thing that tells you to choose one or not the other? Or one's right or one's wrong? Well, this morning I submit to you that that is what we call the moral law. We all have a conscience that governs our actions. We all get to make a decision. C.S. Lewis put it like this. Each of us is like a piano. The music is our moral law, and it tells us which keys to play at the right time. Some keys are white, some keys are black, but our moral law is the music that tells us what to play. And so don't let your society, your culture, hijack the truthfulness of objective morality. But what if I were to say this? What if I were to say, well, listen, church, there are moral relative situations. Let me give you a perfect example. Say you are a German in Nazi Germany in the 1940s, and you're hiding Jews underneath your basement, and the the Gestapo come and knock on your door, and they say, are you hiding any Jews in your basement? What do you do? Do you lie and sanction the murder of innocent men, women, and children? Um, Or do you tell the truth and sanction the murder of innocent men, women, and children? Or do 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 you lie? And save their lives. While there are relative situations, there's always a better moral decision. Do you know what's happening in your mind in that moment? You're saying, here is the standard. And I've got two alternatives. Which choice is closer to that standard? And so the moral thing to do is, of course, life is more important than telling a lie. Of course you're going to protect these innocent people from being murdered. These men, women, and children. That's the right thing to do. So just because you have relative situations does not mean there is not such a thing as objective morality. You see, Hitler knew it was absolutely wrong to murder Jews. That's why he sought to brainwash everyone into believing that Jews were really not human beings after all. They were a lesser people. And it was the Aryan race, the superior race. And so if they were going to survive and they were going to be the fittest, they had to eliminate everyone else around them. You see, it is certainly true that we will discover minor differences of morality in different civilizations, but they're typically minor. Let me read to you a quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, I know that some people will say the idea of a law of nature, which is what they refer to as the moral law, or decent behavior known to all men is unsound, because different civilizations and different ages have had quite different moralities. But this is not true. There have been differences between their moralities, but these have never amounted to anything like a total difference. 
If anyone will take the time to compare the moral teaching of, say, the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greek, and Romans, what will really strike him is how very like they are to each other and to our own. Think of a country where people were admired for running uh, away from battle or where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindest to him. You might just as well try to imagine a country where two and two made five. Men have deferred as regards to what people ought to do to be unselfish, whether it was only to your own family or to your fellow countrymen or everyone, but they have always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. Selfishness has never been admired. Men have deferred as to whether you should have one wife or four, but they have always agreed that you must not simply have any woman you liked. And so this is a guy who was an atheist, became a Christian because he surveyed the evidence and the argument that proved God to be true to this man was the argument that we're discussing today. C.S. Lewis put it like this. Here I said there was so much wrong with the world and there was so much evil, just like we've experienced five days ago. But he said, how could I say there's something wrong with the world if I didn't know what it meant to be right? How could I say a line was crooked if I didn't know what a straight line was? And so we should hold very strongly that what that man did in Annapolis, Maryland, was objectively wrong no matter what. He took the lives of innocent people. That was wrong. And it's not just a social construct. It's not just something that we feel in our hearts that is wrong. It is wrong for all people, all places, all times. Well, the question that we're answering this morning is why? So if you're going to put it in an argument form, here's premise one. If God does not exist... Objective moral values and duties do not exist. That is our contention. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Because without God, naturalism is true. And the choices that you make is just an illusion. Free will is just an illusion. Now, this is not to say that atheists are immoral or bad people. This is to say, without God, there is nothing that grounds our moral values and duties to make them objective. Otherwise, it's just one species against another. Human beings are no more viable than other species in the animal kingdom. If biological naturalism is true, right, evolutionary naturalism is true, we are just a different kind of species with a different kind of morality. Dolphins who may kill or rape one another, that's just what's morally relative for them. Animals that eat and kill one another, that's just what's morally relative for them. So this is something that we need to really hold strong on as Christians. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. You see, morality that merely comes as a product of biological evolution, and it's just a social construct for the flourishing of our species, there really isn't anything objectively wrong with rape or murder. You can say that you don't like it. You can say that it's socially taboo, but there's really nothing to ground to say that is absolutely wrong. Why? Because your morality is based on survival and biology, not on what is true. Can you see the difference? Now, that's not to say science is wrong, and that's not even to say, remember, we're granting. Let's even say we obtained our morals through biological evolution. At the end of the day, we're asking this question, are there objective moral values and duties? There's a famous dilemma that was presented called the Euthyphro Dilemma. Let me present it to you like this. It goes like this. Is something good because God wills it? Then the good is arbitrary. Does God will something because it's good? Then it's a moral value inherent of God. So you can see how this is actually a problem. I'm going to read it to you again. It's called the Euthyphro Dilemma. It should be up on the screen for you. Is something good because God wills it? Then the good is arbitrary. Does God will something because it is good? Then it's a moral value independent of God. I watched a debate between William Lane Craig and a really popular uh, physicist named Lawrence Krauss. And Lawrence Krauss is an atheist and he was up on stage and he said this. If God said that rape was right, would it be right? And of course, everybody in this room, we're all sitting here saying, well, no, it wouldn't be right if God said that rape was right. Why? Because rape is objectively wrong. That's something that is absolutely wrong. And so he says, see, God even has a moral standard that he has to adhere to, which means objective moral values and duties do not come from God. 
Ah, but then William Lane Craig, Matt shared with you his book last week, gets up, and he says, you've given us a false choice. God would never say that rape is right. Why? Because it goes against his nature. It's an illogical premise to say that God would ever say rape is morally good or it's the right thing to do. God would never say that because God's moral commands come from who he is. It flows forth from his nature. When you pick up your Bible and you read it and you see the commands that God has given you, God is giving you his commands based off of his character, not off of some arbitrary reasoning above himself. And so the answer is simply this. God wills something because he is good. God is the paradigm of good. William Lane Craig says this, When atheists demand, if God were to command child abuse, would we be obligated to abuse our children? He's asking a question like, if there were a square circle, would its area be the square of one of its sides? It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. He goes on to say, there is no answer because what is supposed is logically impossible. When we look at the Bible, for instance, we do find this. Psalms chapter 136 verse 1 says this, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Mark chapter 10 verse 18, Jesus says no one is good except for God alone. And so God is the paradigm of morality. It is his nature and his person that reflects his divine commands. God would never command us to do something that is objectively immoral. And so it's really a false choice and it's an illogical proposition. And so we can reasonably say that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. What about premise two? What do we find to be true? This is what we've been saying all morning. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Everybody in this room knows that what that man in Annapolis did was absolutely wrong, regardless of what he thinks. We all know that rape and child abuse, and torture are unacceptable because they are moral abominations. And this is universally true for all people, all times, and all places. Now, some people might disagree on who you can torture, but no one ever agreed, no society ever agreed that torturing people for fun was objectively good. You see, most of us also recognize that love and generosity and self-sacrifice are really good things. Let me, let me prove this to be true to you. There are certain religious things that people have done in the history and even up till today that we look at that and we say, that is wrong. Hindus, for instance, there's a Hindu funeral custom. It's where the widow is forcibly burned alive on her husband's uh, funeral pyres. It's she's, she she's literally either does it herself or the community can force her and burn her alive on top of her husband's funeral pyres. Is that wrong? Yes, that's wrong. I don't care what a religious person says. That is, that is objectively wrong. Well, think about this Chinese custom. There's an ancient Chinese custom for crippling women for life by tightly binding their feet from childhood to resemble the, a lotus blossom. Is that right or wrong? When religious men abuse children, and this is something that I have found to be true. For people that don't believe in God, for instance, and they don't think that morality is objectively true, asking this question, is it absolutely objectively wrong for a religious leader, a priest, a rabbi, to abuse a small child? Nine times out of ten, if they are honest and have integrity, they will say, yes, that is absolutely wrong. Even if it's to the benefit of their flourishing, even if that means they can produce hundreds of children, it is still absolutely objectively wrong. And we know this, don't we? Don't we know this to be true? There are certain things that are absolutely right and wrong. There are absolute things that we should do and shouldn't do. And so the key point is this. If we deny premise true, and believe me, there are many academics who do. They say, yes, rape is just a mere social construction of our environment, and there's really nothing wrong with it. We just don't like it. And to me, that's, that's incredible. That's an incredible statement to make. And I find it horrific that somebody can intellectually make that proposition. But what we are left with is to say that child abuse really isn't wrong. It's just socially unacceptable for our culture. And I don't know about you, but I think the evidence truly points to this. Objective moral values and duties exist. And the only thing that makes them objective is God. Not biological evolution and not our society. 
And so we have an unavoidable conclusion this morning. It is simply this. If God, does not, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore God exists. And this is a teaching that we find in the Bible. And so that's what we're going to end with today, as a reflection on the Word of God. The book of Romans is a very powerful book. In chapter 1, Paul says, I'm going to share with you the gospel. He says this in Romans 1.17. I'm going to share with you the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation. And then, for the rest of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, he's got nothing but bad news. And chapter 1, starting in verse 18, he proposes this. All Gentiles are lost. All non-Jews stand in condemnation if they attempt to appeal to God on the basis of their own good deeds. You know why? Because we've all messed up. Every non-Jew has made a mistake in some way, shape, or form. You've got two columns. Column one, imperfect. Column two, perfect. And guess where everybody is in this room? We are in column one. We are imperfect because we've made mistakes. And so Paul goes through this entire chapter saying, all Gentiles will stand before God as guilty because they have sinned against God. Even though they didn't have the Bible... They've still sinned against God. How did they do that? Paul says they violated the moral law written on their hearts. They knew better. And they chose to sin. That's what he says in chapter 1. Then he goes into chapter 2 because the Jews, if you can imagine it like this, right? Paul's writing in Romans and his style is this. He's going to act like he's got an imaginary opponent. And he's going to answer their questions. And so if you can imagine it like this. Here's Paul really knocking down all the non-Jews. Everyone stands in condemnation. And the Jews standing behind Paul and he's like, oh yeah, Paul, give it to them. Let them know what they deserve, right? They're not like us. They're not God's holy people. And Paul just gets done with the Gentiles. You can imagine that Jew standing right behind him. And and Paul goes like this, I've got news for you. And so in chapters two and three, the Jews thought two things. Because we're Jews, we've descended from Abraham, and we have the law of Moses, we get special treatment on the day of judgment. And do you know what Paul's news for them is? You're in the same boat as the Gentiles. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you have the law of Moses. You've broken the law. And so if you're attempting to appeal to God on the basis of your own good deeds, guess what? There's bad news. You stand in condemnation. And the very law that you thought was going to save you is the very law that condemns you. And so if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian and you think that you're a good person, the gospel does have some bad news. And the bad news is this, Romans 3, 23. All have fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Everyone has broken the moral law. Everyone has broken the Mosaic law. Everyone has broken the New Testament law. And we stand before God in condemnation. You see, the thing about the moral law that's not like gravity and mathematics is the moral law can be broken. You can choose whether or not to follow the moral law. And this moral law we have found taught over and over again in the Bible. And so here's a question. You ever told a lie? What does that make you? Makes you a liar. Have you ever, the Bible says, if you lust in your heart to commit adultery with another person, you've committed adultery with them. It's actually, God sees it as if you've actually committed adultery with them. And so what would that make you? It would make you an adulterer, right? This is something that I've done, that I'm guilty of, and I think everybody in this room is guilty of too. So you're a liar, you're an adulterer, The Bible says if you hate someone, you have murdered him in your heart, and you are a murderer. Have you ever hated someone before? Maybe it's been me, (laughs) right? Have you ever hated someone? Well, guess what? So you're a good, lying, adultering murderer. Well, that's, that's the bad news. That's the bad news is that we've all broken God's law. We've sinned against God. And so Paul climaxes to this point. He says everyone is guilty before God. And in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, look what it says. It's up on the screen. You can turn to it in your Bibles if you want to. Paul Paul reflects. He's speaking to the Jews here. And he's saying, look, I'm going to prove a point to you, Jewish people. Even the Gentiles who do not have the law, the Mosaic law, do instinctively the things of the law. These not having a law are a law to themselves. 
And look at what he says here. He says, In that they show the work of the law written on their hearts and their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. He's saying they have a moral law and it's written on their heart and their conscience either accuses them of what they've done wrong or excuses them as if they've done the right thing. How is this moral law written? Look what he says in verse, verse 14. He says, it's by nature. Or maybe your translation is like mine, by instinct. It's this built-in moral law. We have this created instinct, this innate awareness of this general moral law that God has given to our hearts. And so what does Paul say they do with this? Look what he says in verse 15. He says, they show the work of the law written on their hearts. He says their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts accusing or defending them. This means their conscience is functioning by comparing their deeds with what is an accepted standard of morality. Man, I really, you ever ever felt like I should not have done that? I should not have done, trust me, it happens all the time up here. I get home and I'm like, I should not have said that. That was really stupid. I probably didn't do the right thing there. But we all have that. We all have this conscience, this conviction in our heart. And Paul says, They had it too. Even though they didn't have the special book, the Bible, they still knew what was right and what was wrong. You see, our conscience prods us with a sense of guilt when our deeds don't conform to the standard. And it's ability that we all have. Our conscience creates an inner dialogue and it forces our mind to verbalize our thoughts. And it makes us decide, are we going to make the right decision or the wrong decision? James puts it like this in James 4, 17. He says, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. If you know it's right to apologize and you don't do it, you've sinned against God. If you know it's right to give back to the Lord financially and you don't do it, you've sinned against God. If you know it's right to volunteer for a service or to be engaged in the church or to share the gospel with someone and you don't do it, it is sin. That shows us that in our hearts, we really do know, generally, the difference between right and wrong. The problem is, is that we break it. We go against it. We are infected with sin. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that God created us in his image. Inherent value with the right kind of duties to follow. The problem is that sin entered the world through a conscious decision to willfully do what she and he knew was wrong to do. God said, don't do this. And what did they do? It's like Piper. Do not touch that. Touches it. I'll say it twice. I'll give her two times. And she, the moment I move is when she course corrects, right? But at that point, it's too late. I'm sorry, honey. It's discipline in time. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I give her grace sometimes, right? She gives me grace too, so it's good. But that's what we do. God draws this line in the sand, and we like to see how close we can get to it, and then we eventually step over. That's our human nature. Why? Because we're infected with this sin disease. That is our problem. You see, the problem is this. Because we've been infected with a sin disease, and even though we all have this conscience and this moral law written on our heart, it's defective now. It's like a moral compass that's gone off track. Sin has jacked up our gravity poles. That's the whole point of a compass. It tells you which way to go, north and south, east and west. That's what God has given us in our conscience with our moral law. Which way we should go and what we should do, but sin has corrupted it. Sin has corrupted it to the core. And so we've got to get back on track. The question this morning that we end with is this. How do we do that? How do we get back on track? We have to submit to the saving work of Jesus Christ. You see, he not only puts us back in a right relationship with God, but the Bible says he gives us his Holy Spirit. He gives us his written word that we can start to course correct our moral actions and follow the plan that God had created us to follow in the first place. If you haven't submitted to the saving work of Jesus, you will never be able to become the person that God wants you to be. And I talk with people like this all the time. I've got to be good enough before I can become a Christian. I've got to get good enough before I can get baptized. I've got to get good enough before I can join the church. And that's the exact opposite. You can't be good enough in the eyes of God ever, number one. And number two, the only way you can start course correcting is for God to enter your heart, into your life, and change you. Have you ever seen the one?